welcome to all. Um, my name is Kamal Sijay. I am an assistant Nalinda course coordinator at Tibet House Delhi. Uh, first of all, uh, we are very we at the Tibet House are very grateful to all the speakers for kindly accepting our invitation and for being part of this panel. I would also like to thank all the participants for uh, joining today's program. So for the second session, we have a very interesting and relevant topic that is varied environments, species and environment in the Anthropocene flaws, connections and contestations. And the chairperson for this session is Dr. Mr. Duno Roy. And the speakers for our second session are Professor Savita Kerka, Dean of School of Biological Sciences of Biotechnology, Goa University. And second is Dr. Vasundara Bhojwet, Assistant Professor, School of Humanities and Social Sciences, Shifnadar University. Third is Dr. Barbara Maas, Founder, Chief Executive, People for Nature and Peace and Head of Endangered Species Conservation, NABU International Germany. Uh, in the end of the session, we have 15 minutes for Q&A, so I request all of you to kindly reserve your questions until the end of the session. Um, yeah, um, so before I proceed with today's second session, I would like to share a brief introduction of our chairperson. Um, Mr. Dunoroy, nearing 80, chemical engineer by training, social scientist by compulsion. Uh, please come up on the stage, chairperson. Hi. Uh, 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 all the speakers also please come up on the stage and take your respective stage. Since I would like to share a brief introduction about our chief chief Thank guest. Very brief. Don't waste time. Uh, Dr. Dunu Roy is a chemical engineer by training, a social scientist, political ecologist by choice, worked for over five decades in rural and urban scenarios, land and water management, secure settlements, safe work, environmental planning, leadership training, pollution control, poised on the delicate borderline between environment and development. I now request Mr. Dunaroy to kindly proceed the session. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll plunge right into the session. <laughs> Excuse me, I have a bad cough. Uh, thankfully, Delhi air is very healthy. So, uh, I'm a victim of Delhi air. Uh, this session, I would just like to highlight uh, some of the main issues so that my colleagues on the panel, thank you for joining me, uh, can focus on those issues because it's important we keep in mind why we are here. The first thing that is uh, implicit in the title of this whole seminar in a sense, is that it is about ethics. And we do need to deal with that issue of ethics as it applies to ecology. So it's not a dry discussion. It's not a discussion about technology and finance. It is a discussion about ethics. So I hope you will keep that in mind. The second is it's also this particular panel is going to deal with uh, the link, uh, the connections between environment and species. And we are not only talking about connections, we are, I'm glad to note, also talking about contestations. So the connections may not necessarily be amicable. They can also be contested. And uh, I would like to draw the attention again of all three speakers of how to address some of that. I have five minutes, so I'll just use that to illustrate what I mean. Uh, Dr. Barbara Maas, as part of the audience, gave this very evocative uh, imagery of all of us hurtling on a train 
to disaster. Uh, and therefore, this is a kind of continuation that we are looking at. But I think it's important to point out that there's a contestation on that train. The contestation comes from asking questions. Who's driving the train? Who has the brake? Who laid the track? Why is this track going towards disaster? It's not the passengers on the train. There are other people who are part of that train. So we need to remember those contestations and bring them out so that the ethics of this contestation comes into play. And I would submit, and again, since uh, the three speakers are here, that the ethics has a lot to do with knowledge. We are speaking, we are from here on this panel, we are speaking, laying claim to represent all species. This may not be true. As we saw in the last panel, if there's an economist here, he will talk of climate finance. If there's a technologist here, he'll talk of climate technologies. So we have our biases, we have our prejudices embedded in our knowledge. And that is an ethical question. Because that ethical question that does not answer what are the questions that other species may be wanting to raise from this podium? Are we presenting those? Are we conscious of those at all? If not, then how do we bring that into the debate? I'll end with a very small example. There's the Greater Himalayan National Park up in the Himachal uh, Mountains. It was, interestingly enough, proposed by the British Pheasant Society. Not the Peasant Society, it's the Pheasant Society. They are trying to protect the pheasant, which is the western tragopan. Why? Because the male of the species has a plume, which they use to put into ladies' hats. And when the plume started disappearing, because the western tragopan started disappearing, then the British Pheasant Society got very concerned. How to protect the tragopan? So that's a vested interest. That's what generates knowledge to protect the tragopan. The Ministry of Environment of India picked that up and they declared it first as a sanctuary and then as a national park. And the reason they did it was to remove human intervention in that area. So that means that there is a conception, this is knowledge, that if you remove humans from an area, that area becomes protected. This is a bias. And it comes out of knowledge, it comes out of research. So they removed the humans. Within three years, they had denotified the sanctuary so that a hydroelectric power plant could be built. So again, knowledge is at work. And then there are the people who were evicted from the boundaries of the park. Nobody asked them, how did the Western Tragopan survive in that area? But they were there. They have been there for centuries and in spite of that, the Tragopan has survived. So somebody should have asked them, what was their knowledge? Nobody asked. So I put these things before you because I think this ethics issue and the knowledge that we are creating from here or at least propagating from here addresses the ethical issues. And I'm sure I'm delighted that uh, on this panel uh, there are all women, which is very important. Not me. Uh, you'll notice I lost my hair while coming to this, uh, this seminar. Uh, uh, so at least uh, hopefully they'll take that male gaze away because uh, science tends to get very patriarchal and we need to bring the female gaze, the gendered gaze into science. Uh, so I'm very delighted. They're all 
very well qualified to address this issue. May I call upon all of them? Uh, I'll just briefly read out the biodatas. Professor Savita Kayaka here on my right. She is currently social uh, senior professor and dean of School of Biological Sciences uh, in the in Goa University. She is a marine microbiologist, which is a very interesting discipline because not discipline dealing with land, uh, dealing with the oceans. And that is something I think was briefly touched on in the last panel. And what I find very interesting is that she is dealing with how microorganisms in the oceans are adapting to their environment and what we have to learn from them. So very interesting work indeed. Uh, on my extreme left, there's Dr. Vasundra Bhojwaj. She is the assistant professor at the Department of Sociology from the Shivnada Institute of Eminence. And I think bringing the sociological aspect into science, because very often social sciences are not considered as hard sciences, but they have a lot to contribute in terms of the manifestation of natural sciences in our societies. So I'm delighted that you are here and that you will be dealing with uh, looking at how air pollution is affecting is affected by policies and is transforming life in urban spaces. Yes, thank you. And on my left is Dr. Barbara Maas, who has uh, who is uh, a steering committee member of the International Alliance Against Health Risks in Wildlife Trade and CEO of the UK-based animal charity People for Nature and Peace. And she's a wildlife biologist by training. So we have this great range on this panel, and I'm really delighted that you're here. Professor Kerka, you have the floor. And, uh, and the time element, I hope you'll all keep in mind. Thank you, Professor Roy, for the no, brief introduction. I'm not a professor. Oh, Mr. Roy, for the for the brief introduction, and uh, thank you very much, Professor Kaveri, and of course, Mr. Geshila, for inviting me here, and all those who are associated with Tibet House in making, I mean, organizing this event. It's a pleasure to be in Delhi right from Goa and I think it's a very pleasant climate also which was quite suitable for us. <laughs> okay so um, the whole morning you must have heard of so many deliberations of how we have destroyed our planet and uh, it's beyond limits but to tell all of you we are just 0.01 percent of all the animal population in this world and 2.5 percent of the biomass of all the animals However, we have managed to destroy 95% of the planet already. So that's the humans. Humans are just 0.01% of the animal population. So we do have to care for other animals on this planet, which we don't do. And it's becoming a disaster and uh, irreparable, but we have to find out solutions and be positive to repair all the damage which we have done. So I'm a microbiologist, so I look into micro solutions to solve certain problems. And I just want anyone to guess in this picture, what do you feel this is? This is a macro picture of a micro thing, but you can see it with your eyes. Can you guess, anyone, can you guess what this is? Pardon? Huh? I'll do, no, no. If you magnify a small thing, I mean, it's one centimeter. It looks like this. Pardon? Okay, you're close to it. It's a leaf which has water drops on it. Now, this is a lotus leaf, which if you look at it in a micro a microscopically, it looks like this. And these are tiny drops of water. So if you look at the surface, the surface is hydrophobic. That means it doesn't absorb any moisture. So these droplets remain on the water, on, on the leaf. And that's how we see the lotus. I mean, you must have seen a lotus leaf, right? Now, based on this, we have made 
a cloth called nanotol and all of you must have used it in your houses it's called the nanotechnology cloth which doesn't absorb moisture but keeps the water on the surface for it. so it's a very beautiful cleaning uh, cloth which you get which doesn't absorb the dirt but keeps the dirt on the surface so you can wash the cloth very easily now this is one aspect of technology which the idea has come from the nature around you so just the observation of a leaf with some water on it can give you beautiful ideas to solve problems in nature so my talk is on biomimetics and biomimetics is biomimetics it's a bio biological organisms you use any nature organisms in nature and mimic it mimic the function what it does to solve problems of human kind so these are just to bring out solutions on all the destruction we have done so we have a big array of organisms we have bacteria which are my favorite which have are so tiny one mu in size but they have a full biological system they can do anything which we can do so they are so tiny but they have the whole system we have plants which have chemical energy conversion mechanisms they have hydrophobicity they are uh, they have a self cleaning device they have a drag reduction they have hydrophilicity addition motion then we have insects spiders lizards frogs which have a reversible addition in dry and wet environments aquatic animals with a hydrodynamic drag and energy production birds which have a aerodynamic lift a light coloration camouflage and insulation sea shells bones and teeth with high mechanical strength spider webs with biological self assembly moth eyes and uh, stru with st structural colorations which have a anti reflective surface fur and skin of polar bears which have a thermal insulation biological systems which have a self healing and sensory devices okay so these are different examples and i'll cover some of them because the time is limited now but it's a very interesting topic which fascinates me a lot that's why i decided to speak on this so whenever you go to a field and take a walk in the fields you must have realized certain uh prickly things coming on your trousers or or pants or dresses and this is known as the burr flower so there is a burr flower which has a hook there and it's very difficult to if you put your clothes in the washing machine that doesn't go off you have to remove it with your hand because if you see it microscopically this is what the burr plant looks like it has a hook and that's how it gets entangled into the cloth okay so based on this idea we have the uh, the tape called velcro which all of us have used we use it even as for a strap this is velcro so the idea has come from this burr flower so it has a hook and it it catches the this the second example is mussels we have these green mussels mytilus edulis mytilus gallo provencialis is their scientific name and these mussels have a beautiful sensation where the foot comes out of the mussel and they can sense anything which is toxic so the japanese have used this to sense toxic uh, chemicals however this mussel once it knows that a surface is very conducible for it to attach it produces a, a fiber called the byssus thread and this is a adhesive type of a glue which sticks to the surface immediately when the surface is safe for it to adhere to so this glue has been uh, researched upon and it's the only glue which can stick something in a watery environment in water we don't have any glue at present which can stick in water so this has been used to stick especially when you have to do operations of embryos Uh, in the womb of the mother and newborn babies because when you stitch them their skin is too delicate so you can't even use a, a a needle and a thread so you you can stitch them with this glue which is very biocompatible and non toxic okay so this is uh, in surgeries it's a water resistant glue okay now this is another example like we have a lot of skyscrapers 
And in Pennsylvania, they build buildings and buildings like concrete jungles where there are hardly any trees. And sometimes they plant huge trees there and the reflection of those trees comes in that glass. And birds come and hit their cells on the glass and 1,500 1, birds per day used to die in Pennsylvania just by hitting on the glass and falling down because they see the trees in the glass, the reflection of the glass. So this was a big um, uh, a problem there where all the wildlife was dying off because of uh, hitting their heads and uh, dying. So one scientist observed the spider web. Now the spider web, there is a, a spider which is uh, called ob, ob orb weaver spider and this has a special type of a thread which reflects when the light falls on this web it reflects uv light and the uv light can be sensed only by birds and other animals whereas humans cannot sense uv light so when the birds go near the web they actually have ready-made food there because the spider nicely wraps its insects whatever it has to store and eat in future it wraps it up and keeps it in its web so the birds never go near that web because it's it reflects uv light and uv light is supposed to be dangerous for the eyes of the birds so scientists have put this component from the spider's web in the glass and they made this glass which is known as orny lux glass Okay, that's the, uh, um, I mean, the commercial name. And this is what we see, but this is what the birds see. So when they look at this glass, it looks full of fibers and very dangerous for them. So they don't approach them. And this is how this issue of the skyscrapers, death of the birds was solved by um, manufacturing this Ornilux glass, which came from the idea of a spider web. The next problem is of pollution of water. The next war we have in future will be for water because all our waters are polluted. Now in Dubai and all the Middle Eastern countries, they have a desalination system also where they spend lots of money to remove the salt from water, from sea water and use it as drinking water. So here we have an organism which is known as a diatom. It is a microalgae actually which is composed of silica. So these are some of the diatoms you see in the picture on top. The powdery form of that is, has been made into a filter and now they're artificially making this filter as well by isolating the chemical compounds from it so that we don't destroy the diatoms from the sea. And this was, is known as an aquamodate filter. And they have a property of filtering seawater, not only the salinity, the salt from it, but even the pollutants. So this has been used for making drinking water. It's used as a special filter. So it even gets rid of contaminants like arsenic and microplastics, which is going to be a big problem in future because we have dumped a lot of plastics into the ocean, which are getting converted to microplastics. The next example is the foot pads. You must have seen the, the movie on Spider-Man. So Spider-Man climbs on walls. So the idea of that Spider-Man is from the, the foot pads of the lizards. We see our wall lizards uh, on the wall and they nicely can walk on a straight wall. So these are the foot pads and there are lots of shoes and socks which have been designed for the grip, especially for sportsmen, so they, can, uh, they don't slip on slippery surfaces. The next uh, um, example is the termites. We have termites which live on mounds and especially in Africa, we have a special place called Masai Mara and Masai Ma Ma Mara means uh, um, these mounds of these ants. Okay, so these are white ants and these white ants uh, have a beautiful cooling system. So that's why the snakes go and live in the houses of these uh, white ants. They eat all the ants and then make it their home. So it's a, a very cool house where you don't need an air conditioning system. So it's air conditioned on its own because they uh, secrete certain metabolites when they eat the soil and excrete it. And then this gets converted into a very cold soil, which keeps the moisture content. So in Africa, because of the heat, they have made walls with uh, this component so that you don't need any air conditioning system, which saves a lot of energy. 
The next is the robotic arm, which is uh, inspired by the trunk of elephants. So if you see the trunk of elephant, it has a lot of linkage units. This is how the trunk is inside, but it's cartilage bones. However, now robots have been made. The robotic arm has been made with this structure, so it can catch or um, grasp any sort of an object which is very minute as well. These robotic arms have been used for neurosurgery operations, uh, so that, you know, sometimes even if you move your hand, as a patient may get paralyzed if you touch a nerve. So this robotic arm is even used for these uh, operations. The next example is the kingfisher the beak of a kingfisher. If you look at a kingfisher, it's so swift. It, it doesn't make any sound when it, when it um, wants to catch its prey, that is the fish. And it goes very slowly, but at a very high speed. And when the beak is put into water, the water also doesn't move. It's very swift. So the fish never know that the kingfisher is going to come and pick them up. So they're so swift. So based on the kingfisher beak, the Japanese made a very fast train called the Shinkansen train. And this is the fastest train in the world. And this train initially when it was designed, the front part of the train used to catch a lot of air and there was a sound which was coming when it went into the tunnel. So the Japanese are very meticulous in designing technology. So they wanted to get rid of this sound and they got inspired by the kingfisher beak. And that is how the train was modified to this. So here you can see a kingfisher uh, picking up fish from the water. And here you can see the 500 series of the Shinkansen train, which is different from the previous series, which doesn't make any sound. It is the fastest train in the world and runs for 200 miles per hour. So saves a lot of energy, no friction as well. The next is the butterfly wings. They have iridescent wings and they have water resistant qualities. So we have a lot of solar cells or solar panels now, which we put to save energy. And these solar panels have a big problem of getting cleaned. You have to clean them very regularly. So if you use the compound which is there in the wings of these butterflies, you can clean the solar panel very easily and you can make different colored solar panels as well. This is an artificial sponge. Okay, and we have organisms which are invertebrates, which uh, are sponges, and they are, belong to the phylum Porifera. And uh, artificial sponge has been made now as a water pollution bioremediator. Now, this sponge is very similar to the canal system of sponges. A sponge has a mouth and it has a very beautiful filtering unit where it filters all the water from the sea when it comes into their body. So a titanium oxide and cyclodextrin network structure has been uh, made artificially. And you can put this sponge in water, which is polluted, and get rid of all the pollutants from the water. They get adsorbed in the sponge. You remove the sponge from the water and dry this sponge in the, in the sunlight, and all the pollutants uh, are, are volatile, so they just disappear. So this is a beautiful mechanism. Another mechanism is the sea urchin. So the sea urchin, okay. So the sea urchin has very sharp needles and it has a, a, a system where it can sharpen its needles on its own. So whenever a prey, uh, a predator comes, it can just, you know, sharpen its needles automatically. So they have studied this system and they have made tools which do not need to uh, get sharpened regularly. The same sea urchin has five uh, teeth and it has very sharp teeth which can even crush stone. So this mechanism also, it's made up of calcite. So this mecha uh, me mechanism has been studied and they devise self-sharpening devices. And um, these have been used, so it's made of calcite which can um, break up sharp things, hard things, sorry. This is my polar bear from the Arctic. So I love polar bears. <laughs> so I said I have to give one example. So if you see the polar bears, um, the hair of the polar bears is elastic. It is hollow and it stretches and repels water as well. So this idea has been adapted in making coats and sweaters, which you don't have to um, even wash because they repel water. So even they repel sweat. 
This is another car, a Mercedes car, which has been uh, biomimicked with a, a box fish from the coral reefs. So it has a very high speed. It saves petrol. So these are some of the designs. This is a nautilus shell, which follows the Fibonacci frequency. If anyone is there from um, statistics and maths here, you can measure even the angles here. It follows the Fibonacci frequency. And this is the intricate way organisms are made in nature. So that's the shell there, the nautilus shell, which has been cut. And this is a staircase which has been constructed. So a lot of architectural monuments have been constructed using uh, these different organisms. This is a camouflage technique where we have cephalopods like sepia, loligo, octopus, which can change color according to their surrounding environment. So this has been used for military applications where they make clothes which can camouflage with the surrounding. This is a, a shell which we normally collect from the beaches, a natural shell. And this is called the Kalatrava she shell. And a Chicago spire has been made with uh, the architecture of this shell. Another shell is called the Venus flower sponge. So this uh, structure has uh, got the, uh, the, the prize in 2003, Skyscraper Award. So this is uh, this shell lives in very um, what do you say drastic environments which have very high pressure and wave action. So this monument can bear the air and the wind pressure. Okay, and this is a, a solar powered spy plane. This is like a drone. The idea of this came from a bat. Okay, so this is how we can spy in other people's houses and other countries as well. The American government uses this a lot. Now, this is a very interesting thing. A huge whale, which is tons uh, in its weight, is moved and turn itself with a very small flipper, which has tiny tubercles, which is even half a meter in size. So a huge whale has one right flipper and the whole body can be turned with that. So people, I mean, scientists studied this flipper and they have designed different turbines. Even the, the wings of the aeroplane have these tubercles on it. So they have less friction in the air. And also the fans that are there on the uh, Mumbai and Delhi airport, these fans, if you uh, see them, they have uh, small cuts on, the, on their blades, which are like the tubercles of the whale, whale flippers. So they are used in turbines as well. This you all know that uh, the idea of the, the cat's eye have been used for road studs, which give us light at night. So the cats have a chemical called tapetum in their eyes, and this emits uh, light at night. So this is what we use in our roads, so that we can demarcate the roads, the central part of the road. It's OK, one last slide. So these are vacuum suckers, which are inspired with um, the octopus suckers. And these have been used in, in medicine, where we can also do tissue transplants, because otherwise you have to cut the, uh, the part of the tissue and the skin to transplant it, especially in people who are burnt. So this uh, octopus sucker can just remove the skin directly with the pressure and transplant it. And these are um, the shark skin coatings, which are of different types. If you see the shark skin, it has a lot of ribbed surfaces and they have various applications. One of the applications is for making uh, hospital walls, which are bacteria free. They don't get contaminated. The second uh, this use is in swimsuits. It's called a fat skin line where um, the swimmers have got the in Olympics won the first prize because of the less friction. And they're also used um, as the outermost coating of airplanes to reduce the friction. Thank you very much. <laughs> so this is a honeycomb, which has the architecture has used, been used in many architectural things. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker, Dr. Vasundra.
Um, okay, I just want to start by saying thank you to the organizers, Tibet House, for having me, especially to Kaveri. And I want to take a cue from the chair's introduction to make three quick points. Um, the first, you talked about bias. I want to lay my bias out on the table. I'm a social anthropologist that studies science, climate science, and climate scientists. That's my bias. You study climate scientists? Yes, really? and the science they produce. So obviously, I look at, not only am I a producer of knowledge, but I also study knowledge production. And you're absolutely right when you say the ethics emerges from understanding how knowledge is produced and what knowledge is saying in that production, right? And the third point I want to make is that the panel I'm speaking at today is called Var Varied Environments, Species, and the Environment in the Anthropocene, Flows, Connections, Contestations. I'm going to explore flows, connections, and contestations through one more thing that the chair talked about, air. I apologize about the bad air of Delhi, but I study air. Okay. Um, so as you can see, I'm going to see how there is a change in the meaning of the word sustainability. And I'm going to do that by what I study, climate science and scientists, right? Okay, so timer starting, slide one. And I'm going to ask three questions in my presentation. So the questions are here. By the end of the presentation, we'll have our answers. How do problems emerge and how are solutions addressed in science? Okay, question two, how does the notion of sustainability change? And question three, how are solutions and problems a result of globally networked agents or why solutions cannot be um, located in tangibles? That's another way of saying climate change is a big problem. We know it, but you can't find a simple, quick solution to it because of the way that solutions emerge. Okay, so this is an important aspect of my presentation. It's called the improved cook stove. Right, And what you see in the image are all types of improved cook stoves. Now, what is an improved cook stove? It is an improvement to um, a mud stove, a mitti ka chula. Right? It's, uh, and there are two types of uh, improved uh, ICS or improved cook stoves, natural draft and forced draft. So basically, if you can make the air flow better, you can burn biofuel in a stove more efficiently. Right? A natural draft stove, you don't have a fan attached. You just change the body of the stove. A first draft, you put a fan so that the air flows more efficiently. So wood and smoke, less wood is burnt and less smoke is emitted as compared to a mud stove. That's the idea. All right. So let's, as a, as a sociologist, I try to do a history of the improved cook stove. And I present that to you here. In the 1970s, um, a very famous author named Eklam writes a book called The Other Energy Crisis Fuel Wood. And what the statement he makes in that book or paper is the, simply this, that too many people are going to forests and cutting them down for household heating and cooking. So we need to do something because population is swelling and we only have so much forest. Right? That is the big disclaimer he made in the 1970s. 1985, so that's a global discourse. The government of India launches the national project on demonstration of improved chulas. Stoves in Hindi becomes chulas. So these stoves or improved cook stoves will burn less wood to fight the problem that Eklam has put forth. 1986, you have the national program on improved chulas to provide low smoke stoves to poor families because most homes using mud stoves are poor families, not in Delhi where we have LPG, but in villages near my university campus, Dadri, Western UP, right, for example. Okay, now the rubric under which these programs are made, and there's a huge amount of funding generated, is that we need to move bad air, which is emitted from toxic, polluting air from the stove, out of the house. Because the women and the children near the stove, when usually women are the cooks, they're inhaling the bad smoke and it's causing health issues, right? That's the rubric. So decrease reliance on fuel wood, right? Let's use less wood in our stoves uh, and throw IAPS, indoor air pollution, within the house, indoor. We need to move it out of the house so you add a chimney, right? That's the solution. So the MNRE, the Ministry of Natural and Renewable Energy, actually developed and disseminated 35 million stoves in the 1980s. Independent studies have found they were a complete failure. 
In fact, they emitted more noxious fumes than a mud stove. Globally, such programs took place in the 1980s, really as a result of Etlam's um, discourse. It's a kind of knowledge production, right? Um, and except China, they were unsuccessful, the cook stove programs. So the, cook, the improved cook stove was shelved. This is not a technology that's helping, right? So by the 1990s, improved cook stove talk had died down. No government programs, no scientists working on, on them. It's not important for policy. That's what happened by the 1990s. All right. So this is the kind of mud stove that was, sorry, this is the kind of improved cook stove that was implemented in the 1980s. You see that white thing? It's a plastic chimney. So it's throwing smoke from inside the house, outside, right? And that, what you see there, that construction is much more compact as compared to what a person in a village would make their stove as. So the idea is if it's compact, air movement in the stove body is better, less smoke is produced. That was the idea. Okay, now we jump straight to the 2000s, right? So you've got that story now. We jump straight to the 2000s, just checking on time. Oh, I have time. Okay, we jump straight to the 2000s and you have something called black carbon come up, right? Now we've all heard of the word soot, right? You go for a bonfire with your friends, you roast whatever you want to roast on the bonfire or for heat, there's a certain blackness that comes out. That is soot. And we can agree soot has been around since the time man invented fire. I will take that back. Human invented fire. Man, woman, we don't know, right? Let's be um, sensitive to gender here. Right. Okay. So soot has existed since humans invented fire. What happens in the early 2000s is soot becomes black carbon. And that is because of climate science, right? So these are just images to show you what soot is. Now you can see in the first image, that is a, is a, is a um, pot burning on a mud stove. You see it's black, right? And there's a lot of wood that gets used. Now in the 2000s, um, soot becomes black carbon. And to give you that history, that narrative, here I follow black carbon. Right? All you have to hang on to is 2000s, soot suddenly becomes black carbon. In 1999, climate scientists from across the globe, mostly Europe and the US, implement a multi-million dollar experiment called the Indian Oceans Experiment, acronym INDOEX. Right? And the aim of that experiment is to understand the effect of aerosols on climate change. Black carbon is a form of aerosol. Aerosol simply means suspension of fine solids in the air. So when you see black smoke, that small little solid particles suspended in the air, right? As a result of that experiment, in 2002, UNEP publishes a report that, hey, we discovered something for the first time. It's a dark mass of air boiling above the Indian subcontinent, right? And that dark mass of air is found to have a very high degree of black carbon. Black carbon, so this experiment literally changes soot into black carbon. That's what I want you to get a hold of. Now, um, and this dark mass of air boiling above the Indian subcontinent is termed the Asian brown cloud or ABC. Now, please see the ethics and politics in it, right? It's called Asian because People from the Indian sub, it's, see, this is what I'm, the point I'm trying to make is this. Because of the work of scientists and their discovery, which is immensely important, suddenly populations of the Indian subcontinent become emitters of black carbon, which they weren't before, right? So the scientists are not trying to suddenly make the Indian population a particular kind of people in the climate change discourse. But because of this discovery, populations of the Indian subcontinent become one of the main emitters of black carbon globally. And why is that important? Because black carbon is find, found to have climate change effects for the first time in the 2000s. So suddenly, populations in India are contributing to climate change in a way that they weren't before because of the scientific discovery. And it has been found that black carbon is the second most important contributor to climate change after carbon dioxide. You see, it completely changes the geopolitics of climate change discourse. Um, so the ethics comes out from that. Now, so what, what does the experiment do? Black carbon, the discovery of black carbon does one important thing. It moves air pollution from the source of its emission 
which is inside the home to pan continental and planetary levels right and in doing that it has three things the local level so near in the home the women and the children cooking are being impacted black carbon effects there it moves to the regional area so it's there's been research to say that it affects um rivers like ganges and brahmaputra never before this experiment right and that at the global level it leads to climate change so i'm following air and how air is forging connections and contestations by studying scientists and the knowledge they're producing right now this is the asian brown cloud this is a nasa image of the asian brown cloud boiling above the indian subcontinent and in the report the scientists write in true color it's dark indian populations are producing it it's boiling above the indian subcontinent the report goes on to say that the global community must unite to fight these emissions and they're chiefly produced from india and china so suddenly um there is huge funding in the development world coming from usaid coming from dfid for projects to rural parts of india and china to fight the black carbon problem post the early 2000s right all right so then of course how do improve cook stoves come into the story quick reminder improve improve cook stoves were considered a failure in the 1990s right you remember that suddenly it's discovered black carbon has climate change effects and scientists are saying hey we have the technology to deal with this problem already even though in the 1990s it was said that this doesn't work right and it's back on the um global stage and um there are huge amounts of projects i did feel work on one such project which i'll talk to you a little bit about um to bring black carbon and improve cook stoves together right so in 2007 in a village in the indo gangetic plains indo gangetic plains highest population density so villagers there cook a lot because there are more people and they produce more black carbon simple logic um project surya is implemented project surya is run by an indian well indian origin scientist now in the us he's a big name in climate science um veerabhadran ramanathan he's at the scripps institute of oceanography in san diego i will show you a picture of him um you've heard of him right he's that big okay um and the pilot phase is implemented in 2007 to show that if you this if you use improved cook stoves black carbon emissions decrease in the village right by 2009 the epa in the us has passed a black carbon bill in the us congress okay and in 2010 the global alliance for clean cook stoves is set up with hillary clinton as the face julia roberts was also part of it um to get 100 million improved cook stoves distributed in of course this part of the world and have people adopt it to deter climate change right india did not become a part of the global alliance for cook stoves that's another lecture we will not talk about it but that's all i'm going to say okay 2011 usaid which is the chief funding body for development projects um in the us launches a traction project um to get so they've established scientists have established black carbon can be curbed with improved cook stoves next problem people are not adopting the cook stove right people pr- prefer cooking on the mud stove for very number of reasons um i've spoken to many uh, individuals and they say the roti the bread does not cook as well because the way the fire hits the bread is different or they have to cut wood into smaller pieces yeah or they have to cut cut wood into smaller pieces right so people and the improved cook stove is costly these are people who are extremely poor they get access to mud from the village lake they're not going to shell out money they want to go to a doctor with the money they have right so people are not adopting cook stoves so projects are now being funded to get people to adopt cook stoves where in villages in india china south america africa you name it but the funding is coming from the us the uk wherever else so this is of course project surya there in the back is a very happy uh, scientist ramanathan who's giving away free improved cook stoves that's the philips cook stove that was distributed in project surya each cook stove costs 49 us dollars no one in an indian village is going to be afford that they distributed it for free to get people to adopt so that they could publish papers and say hey it works but then actually making it happen is a different story right um and i'm quickly going to go through this so i was part i did free to work on a project 
across um, many, many households in Uttarakhand, in villages, where the scientists I was working with, studying and following, tried to get people in 38 villages to adopt improved cook stoves with a very intensive field campaign. Right? I'll just say that much. But these are the two stoves that were given there. So what we found in the project is in Uttarakhand, unlike Uttar Pradesh, the average day has 14 hours of electricity. In Uttar Pradesh, it's as low as six. Right? So in Uttarakhand, we could have an electrical cook stove, the simple G coil. You couldn't do that in Uttar Pradesh. And that is the Greenway improved cook stove. It just burns wood more efficiently because the body is compact. So these two were, and they sold. Somehow they sold. Um, they weren't very costly. Point one. Second, wood gets wet in the mountains and it becomes very difficult for people to cook and heat their homes. So people did buy these stoves, but they were only using it for tea, quick meals, because it does cost. For the regular meals, they were using their, what in the mountains they call angiti, uh, which is another kind of um, mud stove. Okay, so um, by 2013, things have happened. Indoor air pollution, the scientific term indoor air pollution has been changed to household air pollution. So air is no longer, oops, time's up. Okay, quickly, one minute, yeah. Air is no longer a problem inside the house. The house is a source for air pollution that goes all the way up to the planet and causes climate change. The complete different understanding of what air is and what air does, right? Through the production of knowledge, that ties in ethics. Um, and by that time, it's also been established that no one's been adopting these cook stoves. So the new campaign is get LPG to Indian villages. Cook stoves are no longer. So you know the central government's programs to try to get LPG to villages. So th this is the answer to the three questions that I started with, right? How do problems emerge and how are solutions addressed in science? I've tried to answer that by giving you the story and the history of the improved cook stove, right? Okay. How does the notion of sustainability change? Sustainability previously in the 1990s was just air pollution. By the 2000s, it's air pollution and climate change. And I've tried to bring that out by how polluted air is understood and how it moves, flows, right? How are solutions and problems a result? So the, the answer is simply this. It's not like one scientist does one experiment. It's part of a very large global networked um, conglomeration of scientists, governments, funding bodies, publications, discursive formations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right? And thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barbara. You are the final speaker. Thank you very much to all of you for having me. And apologies, I'm feeling really self-conscious. I broke off a tooth over lunch. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, that shall not stop us from addressing this issue, which is not only very important, as you will no doubt sense, to my own life um, and my own heart, but to all our lives. Um, and not just our lives as in humans. I would like to say when I say our lives, I mean all living beings on this planet. Um, so, first of all, I'd like us all from all the wonderful um, examples that the previous speakers have presented, I'd like us to zoom right out. This is the Andromeda galaxy. This is our home galaxy one of about 100 to billion to 2 trillion galaxies in the known universe. And we are roughly there, where that arrow points. And this planet is very special, and we forget it, because it's the only one we have found so far, that astronomers have found so far, that has life. Life. I mean, there are probably others out there, but it's the only one that we know about that has life. So it's a bit of a jewel in the universe. We're very lucky to be here. But we have not treated it very well, I have to say. So if we look at this curve, this is the um, world population estimates 
according to the UN, from about 10,000 BC to today. Uh, and actually, they're projecting how it's going to pan out by 2100, uh, so um, in about 70 years, how, uh, 80 years, how it's going to look. So you can see that until about 2000 BC, things were relatively calm, even zero, year zero, it was very calm. It was Then the agricultural revolution came, we started settling, growing things, and then the industrial revolution came, and that's when things exploded. Um, and as a result of that, and we've heard that already, we were facing um, a multi-crisis. We're facing a situation of multi-crisis, the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis, and the pandemic crisis. And I would like you to take one thing away. All of those are connected, and all of them are caused by us. 10,000 years ago, uh, you've already start, uh, mentioned this. The human, human population made out about 1% of global vertebrate biomass. And wild animals made up 99%. Guess what it is today? This is a paper that just came out in February this year uh, by Greenspoon and colleagues. Global land and mammal, bio, global land mammal biomass, so everything that lives on, on land, is about wild animals make about 20 million tons. Marine mammals make about 40 million tons. Humans make up 390 million tons. And our livestock makes up 630 million tons. So we are slowly but steadily elbowing everything off the face of the earth. Um, this is what this looks like in the paper by Greenspoon, um, how the distribution between wild terrestrial um, mammals and wild marine mammals and domesticated mammals and humans uh, looks. It's the most scary thing I've ever seen in my life. Give me the Blair Witch Project any moment. <laughs> it's a walk in the park compared to this. Perspective. 40 million tons is pigs, just pigs. That is almost twice as many as the combined mass of all wild land mammals, just pigs. Um, so this, of course, has consequences. We um, have already damaged, and you touched on that already, roughly 70%, 75% of the land environment and two-thirds of the oceans. Um, 82% of wild mammal biomass has been lost over the last 150 years, and over 40% of plant biomass has been lost over the last 150 years. This is very scary stuff. And not surprisingly, um, if we spread out, something else has to retreat. Um, extinction rates um, have a parallel to some degree, to a large degree, human population growth. And also, uh, are it now start to have now started to climb more steeply. Um, that means our effect is uh, accelerating. We are also harming, you know, uh, of course, we're harming ourselves with this. Um, some years ago, almost 10 years ago now, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, which is not sort of a you know, known for its groundbreaking green revolutionary uh, attitude, said that if current rates of degradation continue, all of the world's topsoil could be gone within 60 years. So we talked about shortage of water. You're talking now a shortage of food. Um, about a third of the world's soil has already been degraded, so we're chucking more uh, fertilizer at it to make it, you know, grow something, grow it. Um, and we and to generate, we think, well, we'll just make some more. So to generate three centimeters of topsoil takes about a thousand years. Um, why does this matter? Well, it matters because now roughly one million species, which make up the building blocks on which all life on Earth depends, are threatened with extinction. These animals are not ornaments. They, are, they make up 
uh, ecosystems and life support systems which give us clean air, drink, drink, you know, drinking water, um, food, all these things we need. So we are sitting on a branch and we are merrily <laughs> sowing it um, and we will, you know, we're not going to win this. <laughs> so in order to avoid collapsing ecosystems and escalating conflicts, which result as, re as a consequence of increasing shortage of things that we need to survive causes conflict. We heard about the dams that are being built, you know, where people are trying to grab water. Um, we will have, it causes conflicts between individual families, between villages, within villages, within, between nations, between the global north, the global south, and these divisions don't help us. We are in so we're in the intensive care room at the moment, and we need all hands to the pumps to get out of this. Um, but there are ways that we can, uh, we can, if we choose to do it. If we don't, we will ha have to reap the consequences. Of that like somebody who goes to the doctor at some point, I will go to the doctor, and he will say, "Barbara, it's very bad news." <laughs> You know, unless you stop doing this and this, you are going to die. And I said, yes, but I like doing it. And then, yes, then you're going to die. <laughs> That's it. So in my lifetime, um, the human population has doubled. In 1950 to 2023, it has tripled. And that causes problems because each one of us needs, that means we need about three times, roughly three times more fuel, whether it be wood or fossil fuels or whatever we are using. Um, we need more energy, we need more water, we need more food, we need more space to live, more building materials, um, bedding, cups, we need more of it. Um, and we have done all of these, this massive footprint um, in roughly 160, to 300,000 years. The first Homo sapiens appeared about 300,000 years ago. Um, modern man, as we stand here now, um, 160,000 uh, years ago. Um, dinosaurs who ruled the planet once were around 450 million years. So we've been here for a mere snap, snip, a glimpse of the world and we've changed it completely. We have learned, we have become accustomed to talking about climate change, human in, in caused climate change, that we don't even think, hang on a minute, just one species has changed the climate of an entire planet. That is huge, it's huge. Um, a report by the, um, by the IPBES, who are now, frankly, I admit, I forgot what it's called. It's the International Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. I think that's what it's called. And there are lots of clever people who sit together, and they reviewed over a number of years uh, what are the biggest drivers of this destruction. And by order of magnitude, they came out with first changes in land and sea use. So we're converting land for settlements and for agriculture. Um, direct exploitation is the second biggest driver before climate change no, at the moment. Bigger threat um, than pollution and invasive species. So I would like to talk to you today about mainly about the biodiversity crisis and one element of it particularly, the direct exploitation and wildlife trade in particular. Um, and we have always still sort of seen the end um, or that we're still in the middle of a pandemic. And I would like to um, show you that wildlife trade is also bad for our health because it's come. The, the pandemic has come from wild as a result of wildlife trade and it's not or wildlife exploitation. And it's not the first pandemic. Um, now, roughly 70 percent of all diseases that have emerged since the 1940 since 1940 come have come from animals pandemic and um almost all were pandemics and they originate from animals and it's not because the animals are evil and they're giving us stuff it is what we do to the animals that in the ecosystems in which they live that makes them dangerous um and about two thirds of those diseases come from wildlife so bear in mind, so don't say, oh, now we need to kill all the animals. Somebody once said, oh, well, it's the animals, the wildlife, so we need to kill them all. That would be a very 
bad decision <laughs> for a number of reasons. Um, and um, so these microbes, by having contact with human beings, um, still learn to adapt to our bodies and are able to be transmitted from them to us. And that's what you call spillover. And it's, of course, not, um, uh, not just a problem with trading wildlife, uh, where these diseases uh, have been uh, arising more and more quickly um, over the last 40, 50 years. Um, it's also what we do to domestic animals, where we keep them in, in very horrendous um, decision uh, and kill them in very horrendous conditions, not just in Asia, but, you know, we are, the West is the biggest meat consumer, particularly America. Um, and so five new infectious diseases emerge every year. And each one of those has the potential to become a new pandemic. Yet 98% of all funding that goes into the pandemic port at the moment goes not into prevention. It goes into managing. Once we have a pandemic, how are we going to deal with it? Not, you know, and it would be so much cheaper to prevent it. It would be so much cheaper. Yet 98% of funding you know, goes into management and preparedness for the next one, and 2% of the funding globally goes into prevention. Because we like to tinker. We like to sort of look for technological solutions and fixing the world out there rather than fixing ourselves. <laughs> so the environmental degradation and exploitations drive pandemic risk. So it's not just what we do. We take the animals out, we change the ecosystems, they become more dangerous. And only, you know, scientists now agree that only one species is responsible for the coronavirus and all the trillions, you know, over trillion dollars that it's cost to deal with it. Um, is us, and it's not the first one. Uh, we've had SARS, we've had the plague in the Middle Ages, we have had Ebola, West Nile, Lyme disease, MERS from the Middle East, and camels. And they all fit this profile, and this won't be the last one. Um, and the risk of virus transmission from wildlife to humans increases with increased contact between animals and us. So Contact with wildlife in itself increases the risk of virus transmission and therefore poses a health risk. Research has shown that the extents of, so the more intensive the contact is, so if you're just walking past a rhino, as I have done in Kaziranga last week, I was very lucky, um, makes no difference. But if I start, you know, messing with the rhino, if I'm a poacher and I kill it, or if I catch a pangolin and take it to market and sell it, or if I breed the animals and say, well, you know, I'm going to produce lots of pangolins and then sell them, then and slaughter them in the Wuhan market <laughs> or wherever else you are, if you're in Vietnam or in Thailand or wherever, the risk shoots up. So the more violent that contact uh, is, the greater the risk. And here is a sobering graphic. Um, just look at the dotted line, uh, sorry, at the dotted line first. That's the graphic for the world, global picture. Gross domestic product has been rising steadily since 1970. Uh, and the e extraction of living biomass has also increased very steeply during this time, as you can see for the world. And then you see a little bit of a breakdown um, between the developed and the developing world. So you can see that in the developing world, um, and this is not pointing the finger, it's just, you know, please forgive me for just stating the facts. We've caused climate change, <laughs> mainly, you know, these are, you know, we are all, we, nobody's blameless. We are all messing up part of the human condition. So um, resource extraction, partially as a function of population growth, is a huge problem in developing countries. Um, so as I already said that 1 million species face extractions, the rate of this loss is accelerating and um, we need to have a fundamental shift in how we relate to nature and to animals if we want to avoid a very ghastly future indeed. Um, roughly a quarter of all wild terrestrial vertebrate species are traded. Um, the 
scope of this trade is massive. Legal trade, about $220 billion worth of animals are shifted around and, and timber, pardon me. Um, and illegal trade, um, those are the same people that are involved in gun running, people trafficking, um, drug smuggling. They see another high value, high profit commodity, wildlife, with lower risks, is worth between seven and 23 million and has been, has risen by 2000% since 1980. I don't need to tell you that it's not just bad for biodiversity, it is also very cruel. This is a rhino in, um, in Assam that had its horn that was immobilized and had its horn hacked off uh, while it was still alive and then it woke up. So what can we do? And I'll come to an end now. Showing people research, as this wonderful, this wonderful Dr. Sturman said, research shows that showing people research doesn't work. <laughs> so we need to do something else. Um, and um, as the previous speaker has shown the same slide, we need to make peace with nature. We need to make peace with it. We need to get away from this supremacy principle that every, you know, nature is there as a, like a supermarket almost for us to take what we want or need. Um, and uh, because it's become, we've, we're so, there's so many of us now that it's not even just more anymore a matter of greed. It's just, there's a shortage even just to keep everybody in a reasonable standard of living, which is frightening. Um, and we need to come to a more holistic worldview that um, recognizes and acts according to um, seeing us as part of a, a of nature um, and respect it. And I was going to talk a little bit more about what can be done. Um, I'll just race through it. Yeah. Um, in 2006, the UN Convention on International Trade in Endangered, may I have two minutes? Yeah. Um, said that the use, and this is relevant to you all, that the use of tiger skins by Himalayan communities had, was, had become the biggest threat to tigers. And I managed, I, we then, uh, you can see it here in the traditional clothes, they were both consumers and smugglers across the mountains into China and into Tibet, where it was sold. And then they brought chartouche wool back of Tibetan antelopes. And I was so lucky to work with His Holiness the Dalai Lama in this campaign that you made reference to earlier. And the, His Holiness used the strongest words possible. He says, I I'm ashamed and don't feel like living when I see all those pictures of people decorating themselves with fur with skins and furs. And so we put all this information together and sent it out and it was smuggled into Tibet and the it hit like a kindness bomb. It exploded like a kindness bomb. The world had never seen anything like it. People ripped these valuable furs off their their tubers and um, gathered in front of monasteries and um, set fire to them, destroyed them, apologized to the animals. And what struck me, and I was not a Buddhist then, not a card-carrying Buddhist, um, what struck me, they did it with a smiling face. They didn't do it like, ah, oh, I've got to burn this now because the Dalai Lama said so, but I really don't want to. They did it with a smile. It was a eureka experience for me that turned me into, you know, I <laughs> changed my life. And we can do it again. Um, we're, I just... Um, saying we have a project funded by the German government that tries to do the same thing under the title Buddha Nature in Mongolia, Bhutan, and Vietnam. Um, we are uh, already some months in. We are very lucky to work directly with the uh, central monastic body in Bhutan and um, with the Sangha um, leadership in Vietnam and in Mongolia as well um, to start a public awareness uh, campaign that aims to reduce demand um, of wildlife and draws on the fundamental Buddhist principles of compassion towards all life, universal responsibility, and interdependence. Um, in the words of the famous uh, astronomer Carl Sagan, 
the universe is not required to be in harmony with human ambition. And we're seeing that, and I think we have a lot that we can do. And I thank you for your time, and sorry if I over, um, if I took a little bit more time. Thank you. Thank you. You will agree that the three speakers have brought out three very different dimensions. The whole linkage between human beings and the environment. So, questions open to the audience. How much time do we have? How much time do we have? Perfect. It's okay. One question. Yes. Uh, uh, I just have one small question for Dr. Barbara. Uh, in your slide, there were two slides that uh, you were emphasizing a lot on human overpopulation. And uh, as far as uh, I'm concerned, I don't think uh, we have a human population problem right now and in the future, especially uh, if we think in the sense that in Jap for like Jap country like Japan, they are going to have like the population cut down by one third within like 30 to 50 years. And also in like China, they have a problem of uh, young people, uh, new child not being born. So in near future, I think uh, the old population, or even right now, our problem with or our em problem with emphasizing old population is uh, kind of exaggerated. Uh, so, what do you think about that? Yeah. And one more thing is that, uh, oh, uh, one uh, when we say old population, I think it is also like a propaganda. You were saying, uh, like uh, Bill Gates is a very pro uh, huge proponent of uh, saying that our population is overpopulated. So. What do you think about that? Thank you. Can we have a few more questions? Then we can... yes. You are at the back. Ah, Gautam. Uh, my question is: uh, We are living in a uh, civilization which is primarily based on consumerism. We can save ourselves from the deforestation of the mind. Thank you. There's a lady here in front. I'm Jaya Roy. Um, I just want to say it's not just awareness, but, but something else poverty. Because uh, a few years ago, I think about 10 years ago, there was a story that there was not a single tiger left in a particular tiger reserve. And uh, then they showed a picture of a tribal sitting on his haunches, probably in the police station, looking up at the camera, and he said he got 40 rupees for a tiger he trapped and killed. And you can imagine what that tiger then cost in, say, the Chinese market or wherever it goes. And I am familiar with an area in Jharkhand, eastern India, where there were a lot of pangolins before. And they were actually respected by the tribal people as kind of, uh, they're very harmless. And they're very nice to have around the house also. You could pick them up and, you know, put them down. But they knew that the scales of the pangolin was very good for respiratory diseases, particularly asthma. And now they can't, if they find one which is very rare, they cannot resist killing it because it's 100,000 rupees, the value in India. So the poverty is Okay, so I think the three questions are posing the problem very clearly. Is it population or is it consumerism? Mm -hmm. This, I think, is at the heart of all the three problems. Would you like to address it? Any other three? Barbara, you could start. Okay, let me start by addressing yours. Some people, you know, if you're not, I refer you to Dr. Sturman. Research shows that showing people research doesn't work. Um, I presented you not with opinions, but with data. The population in Germany, in Europe generally, and in the US is going down. In Asia, still going up. It, it's projected to flatten out in the next 100 years. Um, Africa is coming up. Africa is going to be the next huge population explosion. Um, and if you don't think that if we have taken over 99, you know, if that we make up 99% of mammal biomass on Earth compared to one 
percent of wild animals that that is not there's not an imbalance then i think you know there's nothing that i can say really to um to convince you it is a little bit as if you and that addresses your question about poverty as well we all love our family and we love our friends we love them we like spending time with them we like traveling with them we like having meals with them but if all of them suddenly come and move in with you into the living space that you have and expect to live off your salary <laughs> there is going to be poverty and there is going to be misery and there's going to be fighting and there's not going to be enough food there's going to be hunger you love them you wish you want everybody to have enough not live like most germans and americans live and what we aspire you what people many developing countries aspire to if we there was more equitable sharing it would go further but the more mouths there are to feed the more sharing there is and there just is you know we heard the previous speaker already say we are consuming 1.5 and it's actually 1.75 times now as much in a year as the nature can regenerate that is a bit as if you are spending 1.75 times as much as you are making every month yeah, you are going bankrupt can i interrupt interrupt the question is not whether it's just population but whether market forces have something to do because i think you also need to understand the last panel they did present data to show there's a chunk of the population 10% which is obscenely rich and consuming in obscene amounts and there's a small population at the bottom which is consuming very little so in that context is there a divide on in the we you keep using the word we do it but within the we there are some who do it much more than the others and it's part of the international climate conference also that you're talking about differential responsibilities so differential means there's a differential between nations is there a differential between peoples that is the question you have to address you can't keep using the word we i can because i am a biologist no, i am not a polit no, politician but you have i am an ecologist and i'm speaking from a global ecology because other data is showing and you are ignoring that data you are choosing to ignore that data that is not fair you have to step out of your discipline and know that there are other people who are presenting as powerful data about how much certain nation consume how much certain nations do not consume how much certain people Sir, consume with the greatest respect in my presentation i said that the global north as you are so fond of calling it is largely responsible for climate change those were that's what i said so then that is why he's asking the question of population no, no he's you can't bl blame the asian population for consumption of tiger skins i wasn't blaming anybody your picture show that your picture show that i don't that it is the, frankly i don't is the tradition why at this event because everyone seems, seems so keen may i speak yes everyone seems so keen to draw la divisive lines north south rich poor india china they said we are all in this together this divisiveness is not bringing us further But yes i think i think we need to find global solution no matter who caused the problem and we have taken responsibility and you said it was the us who tried to pump millions into trying to solve the stove problem here so we need to help each other if we want to solve this um and nations when it comes to the brown, the cloud the cloud that you know asian brown cloud um spoke about this is a global problem that was caused in one spot but everybody needs to come together and solve it um i don't think the divisiveness and name calling and finger pointing is going to help us it is a lot of that going on at the un and i would hope that particular in a in a context of when we are amongst a lot of buddhists there is a better way of dealing with conflict thank you
um thank you uh i think i i would i think i could confidently speak only about what i've worked on and not about um big things like you know the market and everything um i just want to say something very quickly which is there is a theme to this conference right we're all thinking about the ecological imperative and we are um but the world that we live in is not only affected by ecological problems there are other problems too right that's and um so the point as an academic for me is not to say that yes there's a problem and this is the solution because it doesn't work like that when you go and study the world we live in right the data that we've been hearing since morning be it from economists or other kinds of scientists has frankly been around for more than a decade this is not new information the problem is how, what to do how do you get people to react to that information right and that is a and that is where ethics comes in and it is not easy because well we are okay la just quickly right so we are all living in something that is called the anthropocene which is the geological epoch where the human race is a geological force which means we one human have led to the planetary climate becoming unstable but while we are all human we are impacted differently we all have intersectional identities right we have different ethics we have different um value systems i am a middle upper middle class indian woman academic who comes from a relatively privileged background and how i my consciousness responds to the climate problem will be different than my students while we are both aware of the fact that this is a very serious problem so the simple answer is that it isn't a simple problem solution system and what i can do as an academic is show you that it is deeply complicated and nuanced and we are speaking to a room of climate believers not skeptics after you've made that step it's still difficult to get people to act and it is in recognizing people are not the same while we are all the anthropos in the anthropocene right so it's not about pe- pointing fingers it's about being conscious of the reality of the world we live in that's all i'm going to say we have time for maybe a couple more questions yeah sir i have question for uh, sundara that is related to black carbon so do you see that uh, Uh, stubborn burning is also issue of black carbon oh yes um thank you for raising that question so this is older research what i presented today right now again i am thankfully not in the business of finding a solution because i think it's very difficult i am interested in studying how people think about these things now i'll tell you what strikes me about the stubble burning problem yes stubble burning does lead to emissions of black carbon but in the last decade if you follow popular media discourses on air pollution in delhi it is the air is polluted in delhi because of farmers burning stubble in punjab where what about the air quality in punjab that's not in the popular media discourse right so i find these things very very interesting how um statements are being made how air is being thought about and constituting delhi as the most polluted city in the world when the blame is being put on farmers in the adjoining regions but their air quality and their health is also being affected but it's not being put forth in the media like that i think things will change um but those are the kinds of problems i'm interested in as a social anthropologist scientifically the stubble burning lead to black carbon yes 100% uh hello my name is pimple swing and my question is to the related to the black black carbon so like as far as I know that like uh when we burn the wood and making the food through the wood sometimes i feel like it stays better than the gas or like some electronics and even like some people are saying like uh, making food through electronic it will be much more hurtful to the human health so like so what's your view on this part my response is that um everything that causes climate change is not just a scientific problem it is a social problem and let me just quickly respond to you see when when scientists sitting in in a lab are trying to 
come up with the best improved cook stove they are not thinking about taste they are thinking about emissions and taste is a very social problem right i agree with you i have i have interlocutors who have said that um iit kanpur did a source apportionment study of major sources of air pollution in delhi one is um crematoriums where bod- hindus burn bodies and uh, they are asking for a switch to ele- electric crematoriums now it becomes a social problem people are not going to switch how they perform funerals right so i mean the the point is the social cannot be separated from the scientific they are, they make and in, create each other i will just give you um sheila jasanoff whose work i'm a big fan of is uh, she works on science and democracy she actually gave a lecture very recently but one of the most powerful conceptual tools i think she offers us is something called the idiom of co-production and it simply means this how we know and make sense of the world is how we live in it and how do you know and make sense of the world through knowledge or science without climate science we would not know about climate change right all the who did what comes after so how you if you know about the black carbon problem then maybe you will change your cooking patterns or how you um choose to perform a funeral but the social is part of the scientific and i think recognizing that will help us be more prepared for whatever lies ahead rather than saying problem solution do it it doesn't happen like that yeah any others we run out of time but one last okay nobody yes i found it fascinating dr k karan mean, yeah, just just a question to you about about nature and waste i mean do does nature have waste like i mean we drive past mountains of waste outside delhi and all the cities actually um does nature have lessons about waste actually nature uh, takes care of its waste on its own if you consider a marine environment nature processes all the waste it's humans who make most of the waste on the terrestrial ecosystem which we see and we have dumped most of the waste in the marine ecosystem but on its own um, it's like my mother used to say jeevo jeevas se jivanam each organism lives on another organism there's a cycle a vicious cycle in which all the waste is controlled if you go to the marine ecosystem there's tons of chitin you know uh, the shells of the of the crustaceans which are shed it causes no pollution but when we harvest shrimps and uh, loligo octopus and remove their shells and dump them on the beaches it causes pollution but on its own it has its own enzymes which degrade it and microorganisms are the silent ones who are doing a lot of work for humans but never take the credit for it so i think microorganisms are everywhere and they try to control the waste on its you know by doing some amount of work but sometimes we go beyond the limit of giving them the work of do, uh, degrading a certain thing yes uh is no re- not really question a comment on dr vasundaraji's the statement about the climate for the what the black carbon in delhi and the neighboring the states so basically what i noticed was that the i live in delhi i lived in dharamsala himachal and the delhi the place is quite strange uh that what is happening in dharamsala it affects the delhi which means that delhi the location geographical location is such that it can be affected by the surrounding place number one number two that when i flew from dharamsala to delhi so it was i've been always hearing about the stubble burning stubble burning all the time and what you said was once uh, that came to me that uh, what about the equality of those places where the stubble burning should happen but i what i noticed was that one time when i was flying so around delhi there were all stubble delhi there's no stubble burning and around delhi is just some smoke coming up coming up come is yes, delhi is a place where it's surrounded by stubble burning which means that the uh, the the smoke is bound to go into delhi and it is the geographically is very strange that it is affected and it does not affect others this is what i noticed 
of the say over the last 14 years being in Delhi and in Dharamsala, number one. Number two, I've actually seen that through my through the aeroplane. That is what is happening. So around the time this terrible burning happens, then the air quality with Delhi really becomes so bad. So these are the realities that we have to acknowledge, not just, you know, go for some rationality or something. Okay, just a quick response, if I may. Um, what you've noticed is not incorrect, right? Because geographically, Delhi has some, the geographical position of the city, it has something called the inversion complex, where it just literally sucks and holds the air. So you're not wrong, right? But there's something, two other points I want to quickly make. One is, uh, what has climate science done? Climate science has made it possible for you, me, the climate scientist, all of us in this room, to perceive planetary climate as a dynamic system, which means the planetary climate is not, it's always in flux, which means air moves and carries particles with it, right? So, of course, it moves, but yes, geographically, Delhi has the inversion complex. And this ties to, so there have been years where Delhi's air quality is bad because of sand blowing in from the Gulf and Rajasthan. It's not a simple answer, right? It's problem solution. And the third and final point I want to make is perception. Is the air quality bad only when I see dark air? No. If you study the science of it, I mean, PM 2.5, now they have PM 1. The room, the air in this room is probably worse than what it is outside right now, simply because there is wind blowing outside and carrying particles away, whereas it's stagnant in this room. So we're all inhaling bad air right now, trust me. If I got this, the air quality monitor here and uh, calculated this. No, I'm not going to. I'm not going to. Um, I, I, I'm just saying that we are catching up with the science as everyday citizens. But that is affecting the way that we make sense of what we live with. We live with air. Right? Uh, so we should be very realistic. So I'm sharing with you, not, you know, not like my, the, I'm not rationalizing anything. Experientially speaking, when I'm in my house, I close the windows, next day you blow the nose, the dark suit coming out so less. As opposed to the windows open and sleep, and next day you blow your nose, it's so black. So this is the reality. You cannot just the, the, uh, deny this reality. I'm, I, I cannot deny it without doing a scientific study. So I'll come to your home and study it and then... No, I think the point that is being made is the reality is only what you are seeing. But you're, what you are seeing, right? You see that black sword. What you don't see is also part of the reality. It, it's what's stuck in your lungs and you don't see that. No, no, no. It's not seen because it's inside your lungs. It's remained there. This is why you said, no, this happens when I cut open your lung, which is when you are dead. Okay, last, last week. I just wanted have to, to add a few points on Dr. Vasunda's uh, responses. Uh, since uh, Delhi is surrounded by several districts and how we call it as uh, national capital region, Gurgaon, Faridabad, Ghaziabad, Noida, and uh, every day we have a, a floating population of uh, 30 to 40 lakh people who are traveling to and fro from these satellite cities. Uh, second point I want to add is as per my, uh, you know, uh, my uh, experience, I've gone through some research article also, the stubble burning issue, uh, you know, like, like uh, 15 years or 20 years back, there was no uh, uh, issue with the stubble burning or the pollution which was coming out from the stubble burning. But this is because of the change in technology, because of the change in crop pattern also. And a part of that, uh, in Delhi, as you said, there are uh, crematoriums. There are eight big crematoriums. One is in, uh, on IS, the biggest one is, in, uh, is near to ISBT, and one is in, uh, near to Lodi Colony. Anyway, then, up, uh, then after that, uh, if, we, uh, if we consider also the dhabas, the restaurants, which uh, runs on you know, uh, tandoori, small tandoori ovens, if we, if we uh, assume at least, you know, 2,000, 3,000 dhabas, how much of wood are being, you know, charcoals are being burned every day. 
then we have uh, marriages you know the uh, november october and november is like marriage ceremony and we we run so much of uh, digi, uh, diesel generator sets thank you stop this there i would only suggest that there are now source studies source apportionment studies which have been done three times for delhi and you should look at those studies because they account take into account all these things and those source apportionment studies show that road dust and vehicular pollution constitute about 55% of air pollution in delhi so are you going to tackle the big ones or the small ones this is something that needs to be answered uh, i would just like to end by saying that i think this has been a very rich discussion there have been the arts aspects of ethics about what we see what we don't see uh, the kind of uh, funding that goes into what how it uh, conducts research what are some of the implications of that research i might add that the burrs being transformed into velcro is very good it's following nature but it creates a plastic pollution problem too so one needs to take into account some of these issues of what is visible and what is invisible and one last point all these graphs that have been made you know the hockey sticks going up not one of these graphs has put into into that graph uh, the gdp one did come up but it does not say when did capitalism start and if you look at many of these problems they are related to the development of capitalism it's the last 400 years that these problems have started they are directly related to industrial capitalism and its greed and it's what it has done in terms of divisibles so i would just put capitalism as one of the invisible elephants in this room and hopefully in the next discussion uh, that would also be discussed in greater detail uh, with that thank you very much for this very invigorating debate thank you so thank you to the speaker thank you all uh, so this brings us to the end of this session second session uh, i would like thank to thank thank you so putting an end to the discussion okay <laughs> i would like to thank our chairperson mr dinaroy and our speakers for sharing a very comprehensive and informative take on their respective specialties uh, so last but not the least i may i now request dr dorje dawala delhi university to kindly offer a white scarf and souvenirs to the speakers thank you uh mr dunoroy <laughs> professor savita kerka डॉक्टर वसुंधरा बोचवे and dr barbara mas so now we will disperse for the tea, for tea break we will resume after 20 minutes thank you